like to welcome you to the 29th annual Dr. Robert Pavlika Authentic Science Research Symposium. As we congregate here tonight as a science research community, we proudly celebrate our hardworking student researchers. Tonight, each of our 31 seniors will be presenting a completed individual research project, each the product of hundreds of hours of determination, perseverance, and outstanding scientific inquiry. Additionally, our sophomores and juniors will share their explorations within their fields of interest. For this year's Science Research Symposium, the theme, Ways of Change, was selected to encapsulate the significance of the studies displayed tonight. This idea stems from the fact that although water covers 71% of the Earth's surface, humans have only explored merely 5% of it, 5%, after 200,000 years of human existence. We can say the same for the field of science. It is something so vast and common to all of us, yet remains largely unexplored. Whether it is psychological behavior, biological mechanisms, or astronomical phenomenon, each field is its own unexplored ocean of knowledge where discoveries linger beneath the surface. There are still countless scientific wonders that remain undisturbed, undetected, waiting for skeptical researchers like the ones you'll hear from tonight to perform studies and introduce waves of change. Waves just like those made by a pebble after striking the surface. The mission of our authentic science research program is to pioneer ripples in the world of science with teachers and mentors guiding the students to embark on their very own science research adventures. Study by study, ripple by ripple, wave by wave, we are influencing change among the vast sea of science. Each year, we proudly recognize fellow researchers who have pioneered their own ways of change before us. What better inspiration to spark our journey than this year's keynote speaker, Dr. George Yankopoulos, President and CSO of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. We are especially honored to hear from Dr. Yankopoulos in just a few moments. At this time, we would like to thank all of our mentors, alumni, and parents for their overwhelming and instrumental support. In addition, we must acknowledge our teachers who continually stand by our side, encouraging us to work beyond what we think is even possible. And now, to start off our evening, we would like to introduce someone who is definitely no stranger to the field of science. He arrived at Byram Hills High School 15 years ago as a ninth grade earth science teacher. He is always excited to learn about the progress of the science research program, encouraging all the students along the way. It is our privilege to introduce our principal at Byram Hills High School, Mr. Christopher Walsh. On behalf of the high school administration and the authentic science research faculty, I'm honored to welcome you to the 29th annual Dr. Robert Pavlika Science Research Symposium. I would like to thank members of the Board of Education who are with us tonight, the, the district administrators, Deb Kay, our science department chair, teachers, and all of our parents for supporting this program and making this event possible. Every May, this symposium gives us the chance to highlight the incredible work done by our scholars over the course of their three years in the ASR program and to shine a light on the history of this incredible program. This annual Rite of Spring at Byram Hills High School reminds us that our students are not only here to learn what is already know, but to also create new knowledge for the sake of advancing humanity. Their research encompasses an impressive range of topics in diverse fields of study. They traveled across the country to work with the finest mentors at various facilities, universities, and laboratories. They spent countless hours poring over data and calculating their numbers. They returned to Byram Hills High School senior year and raced to make sense of their findings and to make it presentable for their Regeneron submission. They stood before their classmates to have their work picked apart with a critical lens. They presented and defended their research at various science competitions across the region. Through it all, they became stronger, more confident, and more complete students. They were supported by parents, mentors, teachers, and friends throughout their three years in the program. None of their accomplishments would have been possible without that encouragement and support. I would like to personally thank Ms. Stephanie Greenwald, who became the ASR program director at the beginning of this school year. Her leadership and vision for the program will take it to new and exciting places in the upcoming years. I still remember back 15 years ago, Stephanie and I talking in the hallway, not knowing where the faculty lounge was, and now here we are. The program has also benefited from the addition of Dr. Caroline Matthew, who brings with her a passion for research and teaching. 
Ms. Salamone continues to be an incredible asset to the program with her expertise in editing and writing. In its 29th year, the program is in very good hands. I would also like to thank Dr. George Yonkopoulos and Regeneron, whose support and sponsorship of the Talent Search gives our program the authenticity that makes it so impactful for our students. It's a real honor to have him here as our keynote speaker this evening. So I'm incredibly excited for our students to present their work to our community this evening. I know that you will witness their passion, thirst for knowledge, and courage on display. Each one of these students has pushed humanity forward in their own way. I hope you are just amazed and inspired by them as I am. Thank you. At this point in the evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. As a young man, Dr. George Yonkopoulos had a true passion for science as he attended the prestigious Bronx High School of Science. It was there where he wanted to be like the heroes at his school, and he competed in the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. With the help of his teacher and mentor, Mrs. Strom, George would arrive to school at 5.30 each morning to work on his project, a top winner in the 1976 Talent Search. This was a life-changing experience that confirmed he would commit to a career in the sciences. Dr. Yonkopoulos' involvement in research furthered his desire to become a scientist, and he later went on to earn an MD and PhD in biochemistry and molecular physics at Columbia University. Shortly thereafter, he was accepted into a junior faculty position. In 1989, he joined the Regeneron Pharmaceuticals as its founding scientist. Today, Dr. Yonkopoulos is the Chief Scientific Officer at Regeneron, directing the company's research in areas ranging from eye diseases to cancer. He has received more than 100 patents, including several relating to Regeneron's four FDA-approved drugs. In the 1990s, he was the 11th most highly cited scientist in the world, and in 2004, he was elected to be a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Two years ago, Regeneron joined the Science Talent Search as just the third sponsor in its history with a 10-year, $100 million commitment. In addition, Regeneron nearly doubled the competition's overall award distribution to $3.1 million, million dollars annually. Regeneron's extremely generous donation Fueled by Dr. Yonkopoulos' passion for research has helped students, like the ones you'll hear from tonight, continue to develop and pursue their scientific interests. We cannot be more thankful for all of his support. Dr. Yonkopoulos, we are grateful that you are taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us tonight. And so, without further ado, we are honored to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Dr. George Yonkopoulos. Well, thank you very much for that great introduction. And I have to say, it's spectacular to be here. It's a real honor. I think that, you know, science, at least at Barham Hills, is getting its due. This is like a pep rally for scientists. <laughs> and I don't think there's anything, frankly, more important. Um, than honoring and inspiring, promoting the next generation of science superheroes. Um, as you'll hear, I really believe that science is the most interesting, as well as perhaps the most important thing that mankind does. It's what allows us to learn about the basis of life, about how our brain works, and about everything about the world and the universe around us. So what's more interesting than that? But it goes beyond that in terms of also, I think, being the most important thing. Um, I think many of us realize that science may be the only route to our ultimate salvation as a species and as a planet. There are so many threats to our very existence. Um, there are really no solutions for most of these other than through science. So what's more important than the science? So tonight, I'm going to convince you, if you need any convincing, it sounds like these kids are, are so motivated and, and, and so committed that maybe they don't need any convincing, but if you're interested in the science and you're already showing that you're pretty good at the science, then maybe you should consider doing something to help the world 
using the science. And, um, and what I'll do after I try to convince you how great and important the science can be to help save the world, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom in terms of succeeding in doing that. So I hope you stick around for that. But first, a little bit about me. I was born into a poor immigrant family in Astoria, Queens, New York, where your principal's parents come from. Um, and I went to the New York City public school system. And as long as I can remember, I was always fascinated by science. I was that kid who was doing electronics and working on kits and robots and building models and doing crazy chemistry experiments. And then somehow I heard that there was a school called the Bronx High School of Science. And all I knew was that I had to go to that school because it was the school of science. And even though it took me about two hours each way to commute there by bus and, and subway, um, I can tell you, it was worth it. It really changed my life. Um, it started with an incredible peer group of fellow students who were among the smartest people I've ever been around still to this day, who forced me to be much better than I thought I could ever be. And then that was coupled with incredibly dedicated teachers who really cared and helped get me to a level that I didn't think I was capable of. And an amazing science research program that allowed me to do a real research project in high school. So pretty much it was a school just like Byram Hills. And unbelievably enough, my project was on regeneration. That's actually, if you guys can read it, you can see the word regeneration there. That's a picture of my poster. And that's a picture of me when I was presenting my poster back in, uh, back in the day. Um, and I ended up submitting it to the Science Talent Search. Back then, as you've already heard, it was called the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. Um, and then it went through a period be when it became called the Intel Science Town Search. And the whole experience, as you already heard, it changed my life. After that experience, I both had some confidence that maybe I was pretty good at this stuff. Sort of, I, I hope all you guys have developed that as well. Um, and all I dreamed of was using science to make a difference in the world. And it's amazing how life works, because you can't really make this stuff up. I mean, who would imagine that a little bit more than 10 years after I was a winner in the Westinghouse Science Talent Search, I got involved in starting a company whose very name, Regeneron, evokes my interest in my, in my Westinghouse project. I started with a guy named Len Schleifer, uh, two guys from Queens, and then we were joined by an incredible group of uh, scientists, and we ended up building, I think, a pretty impressive company today. Um, one of the most amazing things about it is we've come full circle. By the way, I should mention, Len was also a Westinghouse Science Talent Search uh, recipient. He didn't quite become a winner, but he did participate. <laughs> um, and, and we've come full circle. And we're not only sponsors of the Science Talent Search, uh, but we're doing exactly what I dreamed of doing in high school, using science to do good. Um, we're the only large cap public company in the world that's actually started and still run by scientists. We now, from a couple of us um, a few decades ago, we have over 6,500 people. And we're building, it, wasn't, it was four a couple years ago, now we have six FDA approved drugs, dozens in the pipeline. And uh, one of the things that I'm proudest of is that we've been named five of the last six years one of the world's most innovative companies across all industries. So that was a little bit about um, me. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit more about Regeneron now and some of the good that we do. But before I actually do that, I want to just tell you how hard it is. Because science is hard. I'm sure many of you have experienced it, that there's uh, uh, a lot of experiments don't work. Um, and in terms, of, in terms of in our field, the ultimate, which is doing enough experiments and coming up with a discovery that will come up with a new medicine that will actually make a difference um, in treating an important disease, you may not realize it, but this is one of the single hardest things that mankind does. Uh, and the numbers verify it. As you probably know, there's thousands of major academic 
Um, centers doing research worldwide. There's thousands of biotech companies doing research worldwide. That encompasses millions of researchers. There's hundreds of billions of dollars spent on research. And every year, there's only 20 to 40 drugs approved by the FDA. And most of them are not technically new. They're follow-ons or me-toos. Um, so every year, there's only five to 10 first-in-class medicines, that means really new medicines for major diseases that this entire effort comes up with. I mean, that, those numbers show that this is one of the hardest things that we do as a species. And I said, I think it's one of the most important, addressing the diseases that are, that are challenging us because so many, uh, so many challenges lie ahead for us. And since there's thousands of companies and there's only five to 10 um, new drugs every year, there's very few companies that can even do this once, let alone over and over again. And our whole goal when we started Regeneron was to build a different kind of company with the ability to go from an idea to an important new medicine over and over and over again. And we've been doing it. Uh, we have a series of new medicines that have come out for a series of important diseases ranging from the most common forms of blindness to a series of uh, allergic disease treatments such as for asthma and eczema, atopic dermatitis, uh, uh, heart disease um, and, and, and for cancer. So um, I thought that because like I said, I think this is one of the things that I got into science for. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. I thought uh, nothing would speak to that more than the patients themselves, the ones that we treat, that our medicines are actually affecting. And this is actually for the first disease it's actually a disease uh, called CAPS, which is a relatively rare disease. I won't get into the details of the disease, but this is actually from a questionnaire of a patient in our first trial that led to the approval of our first drug. And they were, they were asked, what, what was life like suffering from this horrible genetic disease before you started this new treatment? And they basically tell you in their own words that it was a miserable existence starting as a child because it was a genetic disease suffering from welts, chills, fever, swelling uh, all over their body. And what happened after you went on this new medication? Finally a life. It would be difficult to understand what a wonderful life that has come at last. Um, thank everyone that was willing to spend time in the labs doing the research. And this, this is why we do it. To try to make a difference in people's lives so that the people can really go from challenges and problems to really having a difference in their lives. Um, uh, this is for a totally different disease. This is one of the allergic diseases known as severe atopic dermatitis. I'm going to show you some pictures. If you're squeamish, maybe you shouldn't look at them, but it just shows what a difference science can make and medicines that you derive from the science, what a difference they can make too. I was actually emailed these slides from the physician of a family where the family was in crisis because there was a poor girl who was suffering from this terrible um, um, allergic skin condition and she was miserable, she just couldn't live her life uh, and she was hospitalized for this for months without any benefit. And she started on our new drug. This is her beforehand. I mean, this is really a horrible disease where more than 50% of her body is covered. This is the way the parents and the children described as more than half the body is covered with like having poison ivy, but all the time. It's unrelenting. It never goes away. And it's itchy. They can't sleep. They can't function. They're miserable. You put them on this new medicine, they become... <laughs> and now you went from a kid who really was living a tragic life to a nice normal young girl who loves life. And like I said, this is why we do what we do. And just a couple more pictures. I don't want to dwell on it. New cancer treatment, pretty gruesome pictures, but these pictures just show how amazing. You can have a cancer where there's no treatment for it. It's a previously incurable, and this new medicine essentially cures the cancers and the lesions that are associated with it. So one can really make a difference. And what we really need is we now need the next generation of kids to really take all these challenges on because there's much more that we need to take on. And so um, I figured, 
now that I've been doing this for so long, it's been uh, about 40 years, I've learned a few things, and I sort of call them the keys to the kingdom. And I figured that I would actually share them with you guys, and maybe you won't have to take all the time that I did uh, trying to learn this, and you'll get a jump start. So um, why do I refer to them as keys to the kingdom? Well, it started when my kids were small and screaming at home or in the car, and I wanted to get their attention, and I would get real quiet and I'd go, shh, guys, I'm about to tell you a key to the kingdom. And they would quiet down and listen to things. But I would only tell them one key like every couple of years, so consider yourselves lucky. Okay, so the first key, okay, involves trying to understand the basis of intelligence and creativity and whether it can be cultivated and improved. And I think it can. You see, I consider myself a student of uh, what goes on around me, and I've been surrounded by genius scientists my whole life. And I've been fascinated about studying some of these smartest genius scientists around me to try to see patterns and understand what makes them so smart, what makes them different, and I think I figured it out. Every time you present one of these individuals with what we call data, that is when we present a scientific story and a set of scientific facts, they look at it as a puzzle where all the pieces have to precisely fit together perfectly. And the most amazing thing that I've noticed among these individuals is what happens when they think even the slightest piece doesn't fit. They actually start suffering from a mental pain in their minds that becomes almost so real it becomes physical. They can't stop thinking about this until they relieve the pain to do something to make everything fit. So I've learned from this and I really think that this is something that we can all learn from. So guys, when you go on in your training, don't just memorize things, don't just study, don't just believe what they teach you. Always try to make sure that everything that you are being told fits together. Okay, that all the facts stick together and make sense. And if they don't, focus on that. Don't let it go by. And it's a great opportunity. You either have to rearrange the facts or come up with a new facts that will allow you to make sense. And I really think that this is the basis of both intelligence and creativity. Because when you come up with a new idea to make everything fit together, you've come up with a creative solution. So. Key number one, always fight to make sense of the world around you, and that'll really take you to another level in terms of the science. Second key, before I met my longtime partner, Len Schleifer, in 1988, and we started Regeneron, I had been one of the youngest people offered professor positions all over the country, from Stanford to MIT, and I'd been awarded what they called the Genius Award for a couple million dollars, which was back then a huge amount of money, that was supposed to fund my lab for eight years. Then I met Len and I got very excited about starting this company and I walked away from all that. And all these people started coming up to me and asking me, what I was, was I crazy walking away from these guaranteed professorships and all this money and funding to start a company that had no money and no obvious pro prospects? They said, what are you going to do if this thing doesn't work out? Which they said was very likely. And I sort of stared at them. I hadn't really considered the possibility that it wouldn't work out. And I guess if I had, I would have thought of it more as an adventure that I would learn something from. I wasn't thinking of the possibility of failure as some horrible end and fate. And since we started Regeneron, we have risked failure many times or had what other people called failure many, many times. We almost ran out of money more often than I can count. Our stock shares went below a dollar per share many times. We had important drug trials that didn't work. And the amazing thing was, I think all of us, we didn't look at it that way as it was a failure. It was always an adventure and a work in progress and something that we were always learning from and reinventing and try to figure out how to do it better. So the whole time other people thought we were failure, I just thought we were working our way to success. So I should point out that it took us over 20 years to turn our first profit. And, and at that point, as Len says, some people say, 
We became an overnight success after over 20 years of failure. <laughs> well, as I said, I never looked at it that way. We were always building and working our way to success, even when the outside world didn't think so. So, with that, that's my key number two. Uh-oh. little failure here. Oh, key number two. Be willing to risk failure and consider it an, an adventure and learn from it. Okay, I think there's almost nothing more important than that. Okay, third key. I grew up playing on teams and loving sports. I think that's really a useful, important part of growing up. But even if you didn't do it, I think you have to appreciate, and I'm sure you do it in other ways with teams and teams right here in the science research program. There's a, a learned value of a team and teammates and going into, into battle with your team. And I think the same is true of every part of life. You need to find partners and a team. They can hold you up when you're worried about failing or when you're falling or when you think you're falling. And they can help you believe and stay excited about work. Uh, there was many times where maybe I would have fallen victim to the whole failure idea if I didn't have Len or a bunch of my other partners and teammates uh, holding me up. So um, to me, that's key number three is find partners and team. They can really help you through these failures. Uh, and get you to a much better place later on. It's much better than trying to do it alone. Okay, fourth key. Got two more keys. All right, don't be like everybody else. Don't do what they all tell you to do. You know, in my business, for 20 years they were telling us, it's all about the products. Just get one product through trials and then you'll be set. No, you get one product through, then what are you going to do about number two? It's not about that. It's all about the fundamental DNA of your effort in whatever you're doing being special and different, building new capabilities, emphasizing innovation, doing things new and differently. Otherwise, you're just being formulaic and doing what everybody else does. So you should always be striving to be different, striving not to be like everyone else. Your advantage should be that you're always thinking about the next thing that makes you and keep you bleeding edge. You know, I'm proud of a lot of things about Regeneron, but the thing that I'm probably proud of is when we started, people called us the most innovative company in, in science. And now, 30 years later, Forbes is calling us one of the most innovative companies in the world across all industries. So if you really want to make a contribution and do something new and innovative, don't do things like other people are doing. Don't believe all the advice you're getting from the so-called efforts. Be different and try to strive to find the bleeding edge where no one else is. Okay, finally, the fifth and last key. It's a little bit about balance in life and work. And I'm going to paraphrase one of my favorite speeches from a guy named Jim Valvano. I can't really see you guys out there. Who's heard of Jim Valvano? Okay, I really think that you guys should all go home and YouTube his speech. Jim Valvano was a great basketball coach who pulled off one of the most unlikely runs of an underdog to a national championship in NCAA history. And unbelievably enough, just a couple years after he had achieved that highest pinnacle as a really young man in his early 40s, he find himself dying of cancer. And he started an incredible foundation that has raised millions and millions for cancer. And he gave a last speech just a couple of days before he died which I think was one of the most heroic and inspiring things I've ever witnessed. And the gist of what he said is you can consider every day a success in which you laugh a little, cry a little, and love a little. And while you're doing that, just push yourself a little bit to try to make yourself and your world a little bit better. So that's pretty much the fifth key is keep some balance while pushing yourself to make a difference. So I think with what I've already seen here today in terms of this incredible collection of kids who've gotten this incredibly great start from an incredibly great school, great program, um, the support that you guys have here from your parents and so forth, you guys have the DNA, you have the environment, you have the head start, now you got my keys to the kingdom. <laughs> I think if you guys just stay you know, focused on this, I think you guys can really you know, do what we need, which is you guys need to, uh-oh, my last word was just going to say, you guys, we're counting on you guys, you guys got to now save the world. So thanks for your attention and go do it. 
Thank you, Dr. Yankopoulos. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce one senior who will share her thoughts with you this evening. When I first heard that Stella Lee was selected to present the senior remarks this year, I wasn't surprised at all. Stella represents the science research program as a whole. Whether presenting to her class or sharing her wise advice, she is always articulate, thoughtful, and consistently says the right thing. I have had the great fortune to directly observe Stella over the last two years as a classmate. Last year, she was not only my class leader, but she served as a role model for all the sophomores to follow. She showed me that it was possible to get up in front of an entire class first period with only four hours of sleep and still grab our attention, inspiring us to do our best. Watching her project come to fruition and witnessing her presentations these past two years has been equally rewarding. Anyone in Stella's class has learned a lot by just her presenting and watching and observing. Further, whenever anybody needs any help, Stella is always the first person to go to, and she will always be happy to assist. And yes, as I usually do, I did reach out to her to tell me with the writing of this little speech. I am now happy to introduce Stella Lee for senior remarks. Thank you, Runner. That was a wonderful introduction. Good evening, everybody. It is truly an honor to be here tonight representing the graduating seniors of our science research program here at Byram Hills. I don't have a cool presentation, but I thought I would begin by giving everyone a little look into the program from the perspective of someone who lived it for three years. You're going to see a lot of incredible presentations tonight showing the final products of years of work. But let's take a little look behind the scenes, so to speak. If I had to describe the science research program to an outsider, I would say it's something of a long uphill climb, like hiking a mountain only you have to work at it every day for three whole years. But now that I'm at the peak of this metaphorical hill, I can really appreciate how high I've climbed. For the majority of my high school career, I have been thinking about science research, and this is not an exaggeration, for every waking moment from sophomore year to this very evening. I don't think any other class has ever claimed so much of my attention. There was always something to think about. First it was, what do I want to study? And then, how do I learn more about this subject? Who do I want to be my mentor? What questions will my study attempt to answer? Etc. I was thinking about science research all the time, and it started to take over my life. I thought about it during class, and then I went home and studied articles and wrote papers, and then I would rehearse presentations for class, and then talk to my mentor about my science research project, then I would go to a weekly lecture in the city about neuroscience and lab procedures. I even took a neuroscience course over the summer of sophomore year to help me along. It was a lot of work. Now, if you're a freshman in the audience right now, you are thinking to yourself, wow, I don't want to take this class anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make something very clear. All of this extra work, having science research on my mind all the time, wasn't necessary. It wasn't mandatory. I mean, I could have attended class every morning and then forgotten about science research for the rest of the day. But once I got on the road, once I started climbing, that simply wasn't an option for me. I decided pretty early on I wanted to study neuroscience, pretty fun, and the first assignment Ms. Greenwald gave me was to read five chapters out of the fifth edition Sennauer Neuroscience textbook, which is a college course supplement. You would think this would be a deal breaker, but I went home that weekend and I sat down for two hours, and I took 10 pages of notes on the anatomy of nerve cells in one go. I thought it was fascinating. Uh, and the fact that I was learning things on my own was surreal, sort of like venturing out into the wilderness, armed with only a notebook and a pen, territory even my teachers hadn't breached. None of the work I did in the last three years was busy work. It was all the means to an end. Everything I read or took notes on or every time I watched a video on dissections or procedures or emailed a leading researcher my questions was something I might get to use for my own research. What I was studying was my subject, and in the end, everything I did was my own work. Watching the skyline from on top of a metaphorical mountain is so much sweeter when you climbed up there yourself. And it's hard to see progress while it's happening, but before you know it, you are hundreds of feet above where you started. And I share this view with all of the students here with me tonight. I studied, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> I studied endocytosis in neurons while Arjun studied the receptors. 
Other students learned about people, explored technology, or looked to the stars. And along the way, we helped each other. Everyone has been congratulating the seniors for graduating from such a, excuse me, such a prestigious and rigorous high school research program. And that's certainly true. Everyone on, not on stage, everyone in the seats tonight has de dedicated so much time and effort to accomplishing significant research, world changing even, and that's incredible. But I wanna offer something a little different. Instead of looking back and admiring the view, I want to remind everyone to look forward. We've completed something incredible with science research, but this is only high school. We've only just become adults and there is so much left ahead of us. To the science research class of 2018, look forward and continue the work that has brought you this far. Keep doing research, tackling self-driven projects that matter to you. Continue to pursue your passion, to chase independence and integrity, to take initiative and seize these once in a lifetime opportunities. Step outside your comfort zone, learn something new, and don't forget to help each other along the way. After all, who would have imagined that all you need to do in order to collaborate with a doctorate level research facility was to ask? Look forward and continue climbing. You will all do amazing things. Thank you everybody, and once again, congratulations to everyone in the class of 2018. Thank you, Stella. At this time, before we award our seniors their science research diplomas, let us relive one of the great triumphs of the class of 2018. Abby, are you ready to submit? Yup, already. All right, Brett, whenever you're ready. This is a big step. Brett's about to submit to Regeneron. Let's see if you can see the screen. Done! I peaked. It's all down from here. That's right. <laughs> it's 4.05 on November 10th, and I'm submitting to Regeneron. Twitter because that's my topic. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, tweet. Tweet. Can you tweet. That's not that good. Tweet it. I don't have Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Take sixteen.
award is given in honor of Dr. Robert Pavlika, who had an impressive vision when he created this program 29 years ago. He wanted to provide an opportunity for great young minds to explore deep, complex questions in an environment where they could collaborate with professionals in the scientific community and seek out the truth. Nearly three decades later, his vision is a reality that has become an intrinsic component of the Byram Hills community. Dr. Pavlika also envisioned that the type of students who would be drawn to this program would not only possess great intellect, but would also be people who desired to be part of the authentic science research community. He wanted students who would work together, support each other, and embolden each other to take on challenging risks. We are fortunate to have an entire group of seniors who possess those traits. However, there's one individual who I've witnessed fulfill Dr. Pavlika's dream every single day. The recipient of this year's award not only cares about uncovering the truth about his own research, he also cares about making our science room, our school, our community, and even this world a better place. This individual is foremost kind and giving before anything else. It is not with calculation or desire for gratitude. Without any request, he offers assistance above and beyond what anyone would normally do. Whether it's helping a sophomore craft a perfect mentor letter, or offering pointed and honest criticism of a fellow senior's PowerPoint, or just doing his best to make a new teacher feel comfortable and at home. This young man is always invested in the science research program. He is equally proud of others' accomplishments as he is his own. And I believe his altruism stems from the fact that he's an artist. He sees the world as a big, beautiful picture filled with lines, shapes, patterns, textures, and light that all form together to make one beautiful image that can bring joy to so many. In fact, he is the photographer who took the breathtaking picture that graces the back cover of tonight's program. Every year we bestow the Pavlika Award to a, senior we to a senior, and we choose a quote to exemplify the recipient. Again, this is to honor Dr. Pavlika, who is constantly sharing inspiring quotes with his students. So his famous photographer Ansel Adams once said, you don't make a photograph just with the camera. You bring all the pictures you've seen, the books you have read, the music you have heard, and the people you have loved. Likewise, this year's award is given to a man who has touched so many in our program because he brings everything he has 
to all the encounters, including me. I thank him for making me think harder, laugh more, and question everything. I cherish every moment I have worked with him, and I fear the hole he will leave when he's gone. Fortunately, I can take comfort knowing he is about to spread his warmth and love way beyond the halls of Byram Hills. It gives me great, great pleasure to bestow this year's Dr. Pavlik Award to the man who exemplifies the spirit of our authentic research family, Mr. Zachary Miller. Award, the Abe Shaheen Science Research Award. This is given each year to the senior who has demonstrated the creativity, resourcefulness, and persistence that elevates science research to an art. It's given in honor of the first student who came to Dr. Pavlika asking to do science. Abe Shaheen had taken every AP course that Byram Hills had to offer, but hungered for more for the opportunity to stretch himself beyond the confines of traditional classroom education. Ever since that moment, the Authentic Science Research Program has allowed our students to do just that, to find their passion, to step up to the challenges that they set themselves, to create, to do real science. One student in particular has stood out this year, drawing inspiration from across the sciences and the arts, reading literature spanning centuries, tirelessly seeking answers to every question posed and treating each new challenge as an opportunity to get stuck into. He does this all with such a sense of joy and so clearly delights in taking on a worthy challenge. His approach brings to mind a quote from one of the inspirations for his research, MC Escher. My work is a game, a very serious game. Taking desperate lines of investigation, this researcher wove together his skills in neuroscience, geometry, graphic design, and statistical analysis, making something greater than the sum of its parts, or as he himself would say, a gestalt. This student took science fiction and turned it into a groundbreaking research project. He extrapolated his work and his future aspirations back into the realm of fiction, for now, with his hopes to use holographic projection to implant perceptions in our brains. I have every confidence that he will create his dreams as our future reality. It has been a privilege playing a role in the final part of his research journey. I only wish that I could have been there for the whole ride. He's shared with us his love of puzzles and tea, both subjects very dear to my heart. He put in countless hours honing his presentation skills and countless more getting his Rube Goldberg to creations to work, as you witnessed. He has a charming humility, a dry wit, and as even visitors to our class readily recognize, Jeremy is always right. I shall miss him enormously. It's with great pleasure that I present the Abe Shaheem Science Research Award to Jeremy Marr. Each year we have a few seniors who seem to bear a charmed in existence. They return from the summer energized by their work in the lab, they're armed with results, insights, and the knowledge that their work matters beyond the sphere of a high school classroom. They speak with the fluency of a seasoned scientist and write with clarity and precision. They seem to exist in a universe that has delivered success at their doorstep. This perception, of course, is an illusion. The reality is that our highest achievers, the students who receive the Excellence in Science Research Award, have earned this distinction through hours and hours of painstaking, daunting, and at times frustrating work. Their status as a top researcher is the culmination of a rigorous journey that began their sophomore year. It's a journey that required total commitment to the process of knowing absolutely everything they could about their topic. It was a commitment to the language of science, the ability to share information with accuracy and confidence. It was a commitment to rigorous, sustained, critical thinking, bolstered by curiosity and sense of wonder. This year's recipient of the Excellence in Science Research Award is a master communicator with a vast reservoir of knowledge. 
whether presenting his work in front of his classmates or on the competitive stage of the National Junior Science and Humanities Symposium, this student delivers every time. He is a role model to our other students, and he reminds us as his teachers just how incredible our students are, what they are capable of doing and being. This re researcher's journey picks up again this summer when he will go back to the lab and continue his work on endocannabinoid neurotransmission. Arjun Goyal, we can't wait to hear about the next chapter of your work, and we are delighted to present you with this award. Now the moment we have been waiting for. We will introduce each of our seniors so they may receive their science research diplomas. As has become a tradition during the ceremony, it is time to look back on where this all began. As freshmen, each senior submitted an application to our program. We have gone back through their applications and taken a quote that we believe best represents who they are. Let's see if you agree. Ladies and gentlemen, Please help us to honor the Dr. Robert Pavica Authentic Science Research Program Seniors Class of 2018. Shrey Solanke, working towards a more efficient and powerful three-phase brushless DC motor, identifying the optimal switching point between sinusoidal and trapezoidal commutation. Amanda Winkler. The impact of atrial septal defects on the symptoms of bronchopulmonary dysplasia in premature infants 12 months of age or younger, a meta-analysis. Dana D'Onofrio, anti-row positive pregnancies, as mode of delivery influence cutaneous manifestations of neonatal lupus. Maxwell Matza, a portable economical method to measure ecological variables of the Hudson River. Sophie Winston, talk to you later or TTYL, the difference between preferred language use and texting by high school students through middle school students as a function of age. performance predicts success in the NFL, a statistical analysis of physical attributes, game, and season performance in NCAA wide receivers. <laughs> Julia Zimmerman, does our own bias work against us? Examining of efficacy in a high school science research program. Jackson Zeidelswag, how do different demographic groups tweet about politics? The use of machine learning generated word clusters from Twitter feeds. Dylan Massoni, the development of hypoallergenic peanut proteins characterization of peanut, protein, cranberry, or blueberry polyphenol complexes during in vitro digestion. John Duarte, what fans have to say. An analysis of the representations of autistic characters in online fan fiction through discourse analysis.
Brett Stafford, exploring how various somatotypes of offensive NFL athletes impact their football success by position. Alexis Aberman, a direct comparison of infant's comprehension of unique versus generic versions of objects. Cooper Gray, investigating the influence of feedback on student performance in a sister-aid robotics course that incorporates digital game-based learning. Rachel Ackerman, associations among sleep quality, parental bedtime interactions, and protective factors in toddlers living with socioeconomic adversity. Jeremy Ma, Perceptual Interactions and in In-Depth Perception, a Quantitative EEG Study. <laughs> Lily Moss, The Susceptibility of Highly Compulsive Dog Breeds to Canine Compulsive Disorder based on specific environmental factors. Lindsay Stieg, analyzing factors impacting parental decision for termination of fetuses with congenital heart disease, a hospital study. Zachary Milowitz, Remind Men, the development and evaluation of a novel mobile app to motivate memory impaired individuals. Devin Wolf, keeping the child in mind, a deeper look at mother-infant relationships through analysis of mentalizing and mechanizing. Christina Barris, gene environment interactions in schizophrenia, how astrocytic disc one mutation exacerbates effects of adolescent cannabis exposure. Jonathan Moy, the effect of morphology on electrochemical performance of sodium titanate oxide anodes and sodium ion batteries. Ramey Barenblum, elucidating the healing response of the neonatal intervertebral disc after injury, functional and cellular mechanisms of repair. Arjun Goyle, exploring endocannabinoid system targets in the treatment of neuropathic depressive behavior and acute anxiety. Alexandra Remnitz, behavioral lateralization and scototaxis unaltered by near future ocean acidification conditions and posterior latipina, sailfin molly. Sarah Huang, high energy gamma ray investigation of the binary black hole system OJ287 with the Fermi lab.
Stella Lee. Differential effects of snake neurotoxin, typoxin, on the endocytosis of vesicle membrane proteins. Dylan Mack, developing an airfoil optimization strip to maximize power sections for small-scale straight blade vertical axis wind turbines using a cubelate numerical analysis verification. Joshua Pysik. Observing changes in albedo of recurring slope linear over time on the Martian surface. Kylie Roslin, exploring the role of herpes simplex virus 1 antibodies in children with anti N methyl D aspartate receptor encephalitis. Julia Zaborowski. Description and predictors of companion information seeking during surgical consultations for breast cancer, a mixed method analysis. Alexandra Bocato, illuminating non neuromuscular phenotypes and their temporal trajectory in spinal muscular atrophy using electronic health records. Thank you again for joining us tonight to celebrate our students' scientific achievements and please enjoy the remainder of the evening.